Good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome to the um, last day of the summit for this year. Very happy to see all your smiling, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed faces. I hope you had a wonderful time uh, last night in New York and, and were able to see some of the sights and enjoy some of the wonderful things that, um, that being here in New York uh, affords us. Um, I want to welcome you again uh, back here to the Global Center. I want to make sure to thank um, not only all of you who are here participating and engaging here in person, but our virtual participants as well. The hashtag, if you're tweeting, is uh, SUNY Online Summit. And um, if you're online and tuning in, um, uh, if you could just say your name and uh, what institution or where you are tuning in from, that gives us a, an idea of who all is with us in, in addition to the folks here in, in the room in person with us. Um, I also just want to tell you that um, this, the Chancellor, Ch uh, Christina Johnson, is actually going to be with us today here at 9.30. Um, last minute change again in schedule. Um, I guess the 10,000 pounds of snow that fell in Rochester has um, <laughs> allowed her to be with us here um, again. So, um, so we're super excited to have her uh, join us at 9.30. I'm going to invite Danielle O'Brien and Lisa Malahusky up to the podium to lead us in our initial activity here, um, kicking off the last day of the summit um, and, um, and recognize Doodle and their sponsorship of this activity and this event. And um, to welcome you all again to the speakers, to the participants, um, to all of the staff who make this possible, I just want to give a, a very warm um, thank you and, and welcome to all the folks who, who put, helped to put this uh, event together. Uh, so Danielle and Lisa, will you join us? Thank you. We got some wooing. That's a good sign. <laughs> Everyone's excited. All right. Um, so let me just get this set up. So yesterday we put together some challenges and some solutions. Today we're going to talk about what we found out from all of that. So we are going to ask you to participate again, but today you get to do it from your seat. We won't make you get up and exercise and all that kind of stuff. We know it's Friday morning. So if you uh, want to join us in on the Poll Everywhere polls that we'll be doing today, you can either text uh, Danielle M-O-O-R, that's my maiden name, they just never 839-222-333 on your phone. Or if you're on a laptop, you can join pollev.com forward slash Danielle, M-O-O-R-839. So feel free. We'll give you just a second um, to get in there. So, oh no. Now it's supposed to come down. All right, so, oh, here we go. Okay, people are tuning in. Perfect. So, how did you feel about the activity yesterday? So, from green being kind of very happy about it, you liked it, enjoyed it, to the sad face being not, not a good thing. And it's okay. If you didn't like it, let us know. <laughs> Uh, we just want to get a sense of kind of in the room, how did we, how did we think it went? Um, okay, so overall, we're pretty good. Good. All right. So thank you. That's good. We got a lot of great information and feedback that we're going to share with you in the next 20 or so minutes. So let's dive right in. First of all, what did we produce? So what did we end up getting out of this, right? So we had 199 challenges that you all were facing in your institution related to online learning. That's a lot of challenges that we're all working on and trying to solve and trying to find solutions for. And those were the things, if you remember, we crossed off the one that we thought was kind of out of our control. So these are the things that we think are within our control. 
So if we start to work on these 199 things across the system, think of the impact that we could have. With those 199 challenges, we had 659 solutions, right? That's pretty powerful too. So not only did we generate a lot of things that we're working on, we actually have solutions and ways that we can start to fix them and people to tune into to help us fix them. So thank you. I think you all should give yourselves a round of applause for coming up with 659 solutions. <laughs> So that's about three solutions for every challenge, right? So we have options. So if something doesn't work for you at your institution, try something else because there's more than one way to do this. And as we know in SUNY, we usually have 64 different ways to do it. So try to find those two or three people or the institutions that you can tap into to, to really work with and partner with that will make it happen for you. All right. So. We've turned our challenges into a plane, right? Because that's been our theme. So we know that word clouds are not terribly scientific, but when this comes out, it's really interesting. We see that students are really, you know, how do we reach students? That's most of it. It wasn't that the students were the problem. It was how do we help students, right? So that's really what was coming out of that. Um, SUNY, right? So the systemness and how are we working together with all of this. Online, of course, that's one of our biggest challenges, right? How are we going to do all of this and do it online? And faculty, right? That faculty are, are some of those people that we need to have on board. They're really, really important. Courses, resources, learning, development, those kinds of things that came in a little bit smaller but are still really, really, really important. So it looks like when we, when we put our plane together, right, looking at our challenges, we have a lot to work on, but we're going in the right direction. That's great. <laughs> so what role do we think was most prominent in our solutions, right? So that was a look at our challenges. If we step back and look at those solutions, who do we think we needed on board? Leadership? Instructional designers, faculty, or students? <laughs> no instructional designers. Don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? In a room full of instructional designers, we're like, yeah, they don't need us. <laughs> All right. So, um, so why can someone who chose faculty tell me why you think that faculty was most prominent? Why do we think it would come out? Yeah, Sam. Can you turn on your mic, please? Thanks. So. Uh, the, I mean, the instructional designers will, will tend to be drug into a lot of these things, but if it's not the faculty, we really don't have a role. If it's not the students, we don't have a role. So it, it really starts, in my mind, our job starts when the faculty have something, another, something that they want to achieve, another level they want to go to. So. <clears throat> You know, um, so I, I'm, I'm a provost, so I come come from a, a different space on this. But I, I noticed on the, the sheets, I had a colleague up here, I, a, another provost sitting beside me who's a dean. I had a department chair sitting on my other side. And, you know, one of the things that we noticed is when you did the uh, activity where you said cross off something that you can't control, like three or four sheets that came across us crossed off anything to do with faculty. You know, because of sort of, I, I think what, what you're saying up there is sort of feeling a lack of control over that. And, you know, I, we had held a little discussion up there is there is a lot, there are a lot of ways that you can control from a, a lot of without, you know, direct 
authority um, over things. And I've watched good instructional design departments do really great, influential, good faculty development efforts come sideways and you know up and down and diagonal. And you know, so I, you know, I, I guess I would say there is there are lots of ways that you can control it. And I saw some of the solutions that were coming by did give some ideas about how you can influence others through non-supervisory ways. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, and it's not always about something being required, right, or mandated, right? But it's about having those conversations and finding those folks who are on your campus who are curious and starting the conversation there. Uh, work with the willing came out quite a bit in, in the responses, right? Find that core group of faculty who are interested, who want to take that next step. Start with them. They'll become your campus champions. And we do that with a lot of our, our initiatives. Yeah. I just want to say our most successful efforts have been as a partnership with faculty or faculty leading initiatives that we give input, instructional design and the, um, the AVP of distance education. It can't, it can't come from me to say this is what we need to do. Who am I? You know, we, <laughs> we need to hear what's going to work. For, every, every part of it is, is faculty driven because who's working with the students, who's working with the course. We're here to facilitate support with our expertise, but every best partnership has been faculty driven, really. Absolutely, that's, that's an awesome way to put it, right? And, and faculty really are the drivers, right? Like Dan said, without them, we can't really do anything, right? So we need to find a way to engage with our faculty and to get that group moving forward. So great. Okay, well, the correct answer was faculty. <laughs> <laughs> so good job for those of you who uh, <laughs> which is great. Uh, and leadership is important too, but a lot of times when we think about those grassroots efforts, they don't always have early leadership adoption, right? Sometimes leaders want to see the faculty generate that interest and then they get behind it as, in a way to support faculty. So there's two ways to kind of approach that. Right, so what resource do we think was identified as most needed in the solutions? Money or time? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Both is not an option, one or the other. <laughs> we have a horse race. Yeah. All right, great. So why time? Who, can someone talk about time? Why is time more important than money, do we think? Yeah. It, it's not only the time of staff, but also the time getting people in early enough so that they have enough time for the development. So it's time on multiple levels. Yes, and we saw that. Was there somebody else over here? Yeah. So many of our offices have very limited people and you, you can only go so far and you have all your stuff you have to get down and then all these great things you'd like to bring in, but you need to do it well if you're going to do it. So you have to have the time to be able to put into that. We were just talking about one of the main solutions being conversations and conversations take time. Yes, absolutely. So time, time is the right answer, right? Which I'm <laughs> Because, you know, we all talk about how we could use more money, right? But it's not always about the money, right? It's about the time to do something and to do it well, which sometimes does translate to money, right? Extra staffing and those kinds of things to afford us more time. But I think that this group was really positive. They were just saying, we, we just need a little bit more time, right? Time with faculty, time with leadership, time with our campus. Um, and with SUNY Online, we're being pressed for time, which is okay. It's actually kind of refreshing sometimes that we have to make decisions a little faster than we normally would. Um, and that, that lets us leverage kind of the campus in that way. All right, so this is, um, who do you think was identified as a resource that may have solutions? And uh, just the pictures are really small up there, but it is Chuck Speeches, Larry Dugan, Perry Thargyle, <laughs> Meg Banky, Mike Walker, and Nasley Kirkjen, or all of them? 
<laughs> Not a popularity contest. <laughs> All right. So this is really showing us the correct answer is all of them. So everybody got it right, okay? even if you only picked one. <laughs> um, but all of these people had specific shout outs in the solutions as people who could help. So we have people in the system at institutions who can help us and who are more than willing to help us, right? So write down these names <laughs> and then flood their email box. And um, it's, you know, these are the people that are, that are willing to help. And there's much more beyond this, I think, right? But a lot of the, the larger, larger challenges were kind of how do we do this at an institution, right? So most of these folks can actually put you in touch with someone at other institutions because they know what's going on across the system. So uh, we have a great group that can really engage with us. I just want to shout out to OER and CPD because those were the other two groups that we saw come up as solutions over and over again. Mm -hmm. People who were saying, I'm a small shop, I'm new to this, I'm new to SUNY, you know, where do I find this help, where, how do I get this, and people constantly pointing at these resources that have developed this and all of us. So um, just a reminder, like, reach out to them. They have answers that help you. They'll take your small shop and make it feel bigger. Um, Harmony has worked with all of these groups, and they're fantastic, and have, have helped us move far beyond what we could have done on our own. So lots of opportunity for us to get help here. It's a, it's a great way to leverage the fact that we are in a system, right? Take advantage of the resources that have been built for us. So any thoughts or comments about this one? Kind of just people that, great people. <laughs> So this is what our solutions look like when we put it into a word cloud. And again, faculty and online and courses came out as kind of our, our largest words here. But work, need, help, can, right? They're all very positive words that we saw coming out of these solutions. So this right here is an incredibly positive group, right? Tap into these people <laughs> to help with your solution. We didn't really see, um, I mean, we had a few that were kind of unknowns or good luck with this, but it was actually really funny as we were typing them up. Um, so many people said, I'm so sorry. I don't have a solution for this, or I don't know what to say about this, right? And so it was like that, oh, I really wish I had an answer for you, but I'm really sorry, which shows how, how caring this group of colleagues are. So th this is our you know, kind of visual Finance, of our so solutions. Bad. Does anyone want to say anything about something that jumps out at them here? Or thoughts about solutions? No, I'm positive. Okay. I got an SOL. <laughs> we'll keep moving. So the bit.ly on the bottom of these next few slides is where you can find all of the kind of raw comments. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, our hands still hurt from yesterday. Uh, the, a lesson learned, if any of you do replicate this with large groups, find a way to do it technology, like leveraging technology. <laughs> so you don't have to go back and type it um, and read everyone's handwriting, which I, we know you tried, but oh, man. <laughs> so some of our example challenges that we saw were how do we help faculty, you know, student affairs and other departments so this is, you know, people were thinking big picture. How do I leverage my institution? How do I get my whole institution on board with these? Um, also thinking about non-academic departments, technology departments. How do we do all of this for SUNY Online or for online education without disappointing the people who rely on us already? Right, and, and that's, you can tell we're getting stretched a little thin there, but, but how do we do it, right? It, it wasn't a question of, um, who do I tell no? It was a question of how am I going to make this happen? And then how do we change culture, right? We think about change management and culture management a lot. And that's, you know, I mean, if someone comes up with the silver bullet for that, you can make a fortune. <laughs> but it's really time and conversation and continued work and partnerships and trust, right? Those are the things that start to build that culture where you can then create change. So a few more example challenges. Um, 
you know, the master course model, changing models of either design, delivery, um, the thinking that's going on on campus. That's hard. So how do we, how do we help folks think through that? Um, uniqueness of graduate online students, right? That's not something that we talk about a lot here. And that's a conversation that I think really probably needs to have a place to have that conversation, right? What do we do with our grad students? And then reviewing online courses. Right. A lot of times that is, that is a major undertaking, to do it and do it well. So how, how do we make sure that we have quality, right? which is a, a hallmark that SUNY wants to be able to hang its hat on with SUNY Online. So how do we maintain that quality? And then some solutions. So right, there's a lot of solutions that were related to campus-wide groups. Getting people together, having those conversations. Having input in creation processes, um, starting with faculty, came out often. Focusing on the people who are already moving the needle forward, right? Leveraging them and their excitement for the next step. <coughs> Training, always something that we can use, right? Talking to people, our colleagues, use them and then bringing in faculty who do it well. So the culture change, right, that was, that was big, and I think everyone, everyone can feel that. And we see it with a lot of the SUNY initiatives. I know when OER hit the campuses, that was the culture change. I think that was adopted really well on a lot of campuses. And taking a look at some of those things that were brought in by SUNY and we were asked to, to assist with, how, why did it go well? Why did it work on your campus, right? Who were those people that led it? A lot of times, and you know, we, we hate to go back to the same people all the time, but a lot of times it is the same person who is, has the ear of the faculty, has the trust of the faculty. So get them on board, even if, that, even if the faculty member is not going to teach online, even if you can just convince them to say nice things about it, right? That it's a good idea, maybe it's not for them, but you know, they're looking forward to seeing where it goes with the campus. Um, even that is helpful, even if they can't take on teaching online right now for you. Um, so I just think it was such a positive experience for us to read these. Um, we were a little anxious about what we might find. If, if people were feeling really down about where their campus was or about what their resources were going to be or anything like that. And it wasn't. Um, it was really very positive. And people, even if they're small plans, even if it's literally just the next step that they know they need to take, everybody had something that they're ready to move forward with. And I think we're just in a really good place right now. Um, given time, <laughs> um, I think most of us will find that place. Um, some campuses were looking for their niche. Right? Feeling overwhelmed, they're not in the game right now. They don't have an online program, they're just getting started, whatever it may be. And they're wondering where they fit into SUNY Online. And again, recommending talking to those individuals um, who are, they'll help you find that place, right? SUNY has those tools. They'll take a look at what you offer and what you do well, and look at what the market needs and what SUNY Online needs and help place you. And I think that is a great place to start. For, so for those of you who put that in there that you didn't know how you belonged or if there was still room, um, I think all of our SUNY Online friends would say, of course there's room, um, and they'll help you find that thing. And I, I think that's really important, important um, to take advantage of that resource. So that is all that we have. Lisa and I wanted to thank you all for participating and listening and giving us uh, this great stuff to present to you today. Without you, we could not, without you yesterday, we couldn't have done today. <laughs> um, but we also want to thank Doodle for um, partnering with Alex and, and helping uh, with pieces of the summit. So thank you all. So I'm wondering if the group um, has any questions uh, for Lisa or Danielle on, uh, on this activity. Uh, and maybe if there's any questions online, um, who has the first question? Any feedback that they want to provide? Yes, Hope. Thank you. 
So um, I just was in a webinar the other day where someone quoted um, Apple Classroom of Tomorrow research report number 10, and it was very heartening to hear that um, they were talking about it takes four years to transform the culture with any particular tech tool or initiative, and that you go through resistance, mockery, <laughs> acceptance, efficiency, and innovation. And uh, as we all know what it's like to be in that mockery place, it's really nice to know that there's a couple other steps that happen after that. And so just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everyone. Into the last day of the summit. Um, great job to the Doodle Group. That was a fabulous exercise yesterday, and, uh, and I really appreciate the summary, um, which was from all those hand sheets that everybody worked on yesterday. So kudos to you all. I don't know if you slept at all, but thank you. <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christina Johnson, who joined SUNY as its 13th chancellor in September of 2017. Immediately prior to joining SUNY, Dr. Johnson was co-founder and CEO of Cube Hydro Partners, LLC, a clean energy infrastructure company focused on building and operating hydropower plants in North America. She also previously served as Undersecretary of Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. In the academic arena, she served as Provost and Senior <coughs> Vice President for Academic Affairs at Johns Hopkins University from 2007 to 2009, and as Dean of the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke University from 1999 to 2007. Chancellor Johnson received her BS, MS, and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University, and after a NATO postdoctoral fellowship at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, she joined the University of Colorado Boulder's faculty in 1985 as an assistant professor and later full professor. So, um, and there's uh, many awards and accolades in her bio. Um, but I want to um, flip now because I told you how I met the provost um, on Wednesday. So I'm going to tell you about the first time that I met the chancellor. And uh, it was um, on her first day. <laughs> it was actually on her first day at SUNY when she hosted a meet and greet with all of the sysadmin staff. Uh, where she said a few words, and, and I'll emphasize few, because what she really wanted to do, um, she told us how excited she was to come to SUNY, and then she opened it up to questions, which I thought was very brave of her on her first day. And of course, I had to raise my hand and say, um, you know, who I was and what, what I was involved with, with online learning. And, and I asked her what she knew about online learning and what role she thought online learning could or should be playing at SUNY. To my pleasant surprise, she shared the experiences that she had with some faculty at Johns Hopkins University who were teaching um, the um, analytics MOOC at, um, on Coursera. And she uh, thought that it was um, an important way, online learning could be an important way for SUNY to extend its reach and to provide greater access to SUNY education. So of course I was an immediate fan and, uh, and we're thrilled to have her leadership for SUNY Online and thrilled that she's able to be with here, here with us today. Please join me in welcoming her to share some remarks. Well, thank, thank you very much, Kim. I had some prepared remarks, but after that kind of introduction, I think I'm going to put them aside. Uh, one part of the uh, re prepared remarks was to tell a personal story I thought you might appreciate this because I think looking around the room, I think I'm probably older than everybody here, which is okay because I'm still alive. <laughs> but uh, I want to go back to when I was at Stanford, and um, so that was in the 70s. Right? So my first computing class was, okay, how many worked with punch cards and Fortran? All right, so, all right, so maybe I'm not the, I'm probably in good company and just leave it at that. So now the computer comes out, and there was this thing at Stanford called the, uh, Garage Club. 
You've heard of the Garage Club? Okay, so, you know, I went, and I'm sitting in the back, and there's this guy next to me named Steve. And, uh, you know, now, this is really where careers take different directions. <laughs> Let's just say I really didn't think this computer thing was going to go anywhere. <laughs> but what I learned from him was he was designing... Um, you know, a little, little like miniature computer, obviously a personal computer, and he was just taking out transistors anywhere he could. You know, the, the approach to optimization I thought was just so cool. And so that was my takeaway. What I didn't get is I missed the whole software revolution. So anyway, I go back, you know, in class, we go to these things, and it was just kind of fun. It was more of a social thing. Um, but a friend of mine came to me and said, you know, I think, what's this thing about educational software? Could we develop some educational software? This is for Microsoft and everything else, right? I'm thinking, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder if we could develop ways to do experiments online so you don't have to actually blow up the lab in chemistry, but you could get an idea of what would happen if you did mix these two th things together. And so I've been intrigued with this for well over 50 years, right? Um, so now we have the opportunity to do something about it. And I want to, would like to first thank Kim for that introduction and also for all the organizers for this. This really is my number one priority. I mean, I, real, I talk about 10 priorities. Like, who can really have 10 priorities? So, okay, news alert, there's really only three for me. And then my provost and the executive leadership team are not only engaged in these three, but also in the other seven. So the first one is clearly uh, spending time to hire great presidents. We had 12 openings this year when we started out. We filled two. We have three or four in, four in community colleges. So that's the local community council's job. So when you really narrow it down, there's probably five or six that are just very important. And the state operated in four or five in the community colleges. So that's a big deal. That, that I really believe strongly in recruiting as opposed to waiting to see who comes across the transom. So that's one vertical. Um, online is really the middle one and, and the big focus. So why is that? <clears throat> First of all, I think it's a great opportunity to take our mission to scale. Right? Our mission is to provide the broadest possible access to high quality education. And that's really what separates, in my mind, the online that SUNY does, SUNY online, from any other provider. So broad access to high quality, that's really, really important. I think the um, second reason this is a high priority for Todd, myself, and for all you all, is if you look at our um, enrollment, at about 415,000 headcount, if you look at the demographics of, you know, I know that the provost went over this a couple days ago, uh, the, 14, the 18 to 24 year olds, you know, we're going to be declining over the next four to five years. And so what I'm looking for is by SUNY at 75. This is going to become a big thing you're going to hear about. Uh, I haven't really talked publicly about this before this week, although I think I did say it in the SOTUS. But it's going to become a bigger, bigger deal. SUNY at 75 is in 2023, and setting a goal, can we double or get on a path to double the number of uniquely online students that we have? Because as you probably saw, I will call it, you know, the Larson, I, I need an alliteration here, but the wedge that you started to show, you know, the, the, the curve that shows the decline and then coming back up, there's really three pieces about that. There's international, which could be facilitated by online. There's out of state, and there's online. I mean, that's really what we're, we're, we're those are the three main pieces to build back our enrollment loss. So online features you know, very prominently in, in that. And so we have set a goal over the next five years to get to 20,000, which would double the number of uniquely online students. I would like to give an action item to everybody in the room. If you have a program that's sitting at state ed to get approved for online, I need to know very soon because we need to move those programs through state ed, ed ASAP because when you think about the coronavirus, what is every university in the world doing, including what we're looking at? Uh, SUNY Korea, been in touch with their president. They're doing several things. They delayed class start. They're moving all the classes that can be moved to online. So now if we don't have those programs accredited and this lasts for a little while, that's a problem. So I think we need to immediately try and move those programs through state ed. Uh, but that's what most um, universities are doing. If they aren't bringing the, the, the students back, which we're not giving direction right now, we're, we're engaged with Department of Health. I want to say a few words about that. 
in order to, to have our students uh, be safe. That's our, our biggest priority, our students, faculty, and staff safe. Part of that, and also not disrupting our educational enterprises, is to, is to go online. So we're looking um, to try and move that, so let me know about that. I, coronavirus, it will, um, online will help us continue to operate as a university through this, this trying and very fluid time. So, um, you know, and I think, so those are all the sort of pragmatic reasons. Yes, we want to expand in new markets. Our uh, Open SUNY, from what I've learned, has been mainly serving, let's go back to the, the software analogy. So, you know, okay, so those of us who did punch cards and eventually we got the PC and then eventually we got laptops and portability and then we got the cloud. Even though the cloud was anticipated back in 68, you know, really was the last 10 years. When we think about uh, on-prem, that would be computing on-prem. I think about classrooms as on-prem. What online has done is taken our ability to do instruction to the cloud, right? So most of our students that are online are on-prem, and they're on the premises, they're already in the, the campuses. There are 40,000, you may have already heard this number, but 40,000 New Yorkers that we know of that are getting their online education out of state. And so if you, you listen to um, the governor's state of the state, and he talks about, you listen to the comptroller, and he talks about the same thing that I'm going to talk about right now, which is there is a tax differential between us and D.C. Now, I think that that's inevitable. You know, there's always, you're always going to have the stronger helping out the, the not as strong, right? We get that. But the question is, is 50 billion, on the order of 50 billion, 48 billion, 47 billion, is really that the right number? So I think about ways to let's not send more money out of state. Let's, let's develop a robust online program so that the New York students and citizens that are here can get their higher ed, higher quality education from SUNY, from the state of, in the state of New York. So, that, so those are all really good reasons to do what we're all doing. But I, I, I want to say something else. And this is, um, I'm an engineer, but I did a lot of work in materials particular type of materials, liquid crystal materials like, you know, we have all in front of our laptops. So what I recognize is that materials are made of atoms and molecules. And those materials, and I'm going to take a page from David Needham's, a former colleague of Todd and mine. So materials can have properties. Properties really come from structure. Structure takes a form of the materials that then have a function. So materials, property, structure, form, and function. Let's think about the classes we teach. They're comprised of atoms. Atoms are maybe little, little, little nuggets, if you will, within the lecture that you, you really want to communicate. You might think of a course as the molecule. You might think of how you put these molecules together to create a material, the structure of that course, the form, the function that allows the students to take that course to be and live in the world. So if you think about that a little bit, I think some of the exciting things that we can do as a system, and I don't know how to do this, so I'm counting on all, all y'all to do this. That's plural in North Carolinian terms. <laughs> all y'all can help us with uh, the ability for, we're already getting requests for a program on quantum computing and quantum communication. There's like 35 faculty throughout SUNY that do work in this area. And they've come to us to say, can we provide a program that's a SUNY program taking all of us working together in our particular area of quantum that we want to teach uh, a program uh, that would span the system. Now, let's put aside all, all the, okay, how do you get it accredited at middle states? How would you do this state ed, blah, blah, blah. But it's sort of an interesting idea. One of the first places that I went when I became chancellor was Geneseo. Anybody here from Geneseo? All right, there you go. <laughs> Oh, all right, excellent. So a math professor who was part of the um, faculty governance was, was there, met with the president, and meet with their staff, and the executive leadership team, and meet with the faculty governance. Uh, he asked me the question, could we teach differential equations with multiple colleagues across the system? Could we put together, like, I really like this particular type of the differential equations. It's called boundary conditions. But I know a colleague that is really an expert in the impact of initial conditions. Now I'm really making all this up. But it was something like that. And you start to think about, could you put together courses from the molecules and the atoms where you have best in class? And I don't know the answer to that either. The last thing I would challenge is, we have, what, 7,000 courses? Five or 7,000 programs. I mean, it was thousands. Well, actually, probably 50,000 courses, 7,000 programs. 
Pardon? 24,000 per section. Oh. Okay. And that's a subset of what SUNY as a whole teaches. Okay. So, so imagine you are an 18-year-old trying to come to school and figure out what do you want to be? What can you do? Right? So now with the online, can we figure out a way to help those students find their path, predict their future, and navigate SUNY by enhancing our online presence, which may or may not involve, per se, instruction, but might involve assessment tools, might involve, you know, pathways that we create. So I think that if we put in place, and now I get to the challenges of doing what we want to do, that a rock-solid technolo technological platform that spans SUNY, where we can follow a student, whether they're taking a course at Geneseo or, or Brockport or Stony Brook, and still advise them because we can see their progress in all these different areas, use that progress to match them to future employers and opportunities and continue from a cloud to update what they know by what our research tells us about that particular subject so that they can continue to be successful. So when we think about what you're, what you're helping create, it's more than just facilitating instruction. It's the opportunity to really help students be productive throughout their whole life. And I think that sort of reinvents um, the relationship from our alumni to, to SUNY, which I think could be very productive. Let me just end by saying a couple things, and then if there, we have time, um, maybe answer a few questions. I think some of the challenges are getting to scale. So I've been talking, we've, we've all been talking, I've recently been, been talking with individuals who have actually done online at scale. Uh, and what they say is nobody has done online at scale. And they say maybe SUNY is the one system that could really make that happen. The reason you want to get to scale is right now the cost of advertising and acquiring students is so great. And when we look at the price point of our tuition, because we are pretty affordable, it doesn't work unless we get to scale. So does anybody know how much the average is? The average student pays Google, Instagram, Facebook, and anybody else, TikTok, to advertise? Anybody have a guess? It's like five grand. And you consider that what, not students who are online, they're not 100% online, they might be 50% online. You, our tuition is $7,070. So if they're just paying 3,500 a year, and our acquisition costs are 5,000, and Maybe they're on for a couple of years and then they go on prem or they finish up and they leave. That doesn't pay for the instruction costs. That doesn't pay for the technology. It doesn't pay for the coaching. It doesn't pay for your all time. It doesn't pay even for the renting of this, this space, which, of course, we gave it to you for free. So um, <laughs> that is sort of someone someday will write an article about that. But it's true. I mean, that's what's happening. And in fact, I even see it now. The other day, I was looking for healthcare programs online. So I put in, okay, I'll start out with our healthcare campuses. I put in Downstate Health Sciences University. And what popped up first, do you think? Uh, it wasn't, but you're on the right track. It was, I think it was, uh, wasn't Penn State Global either, but Purdue Global. It was like, and you know, I, I had to go to the second page to get to downstate. That's the problem. Now I gotta pay more, then they're gonna pay more, and then you get into this arms race. So I think the future and what we need to do when we address this is proprietary pipelines, right? Now we are the fourth most populous state. We have 300,000, I think, individuals in civil service. We should be able to create a proprietary pipeline. We have in the central region of the state of New York, and I've met with their Chamber of Commerce and five of the presidents in the central region. So whether it's ESF or Onondaga, Oswego, uh, Upstate, uh, et cetera, Empire, those places, their presidents came together and we heard from the Chamber of Commerce, they have 5,000 jobs that are unfilled. So why don't we create our own job board and just connect the dots so that students will come to us if we can do that gap analysis between what's their background and what are the needs of the company. That's, so when we think going forward of what we need to do to help you and your enterprises, I, we need someone that runs SUNY Online, gets up every day, that's the only thing they think about. That is like the only thing I think about maybe until I hit the shower and then it's like coronavirus and it's this, then the other thing. And so, yeah. Okay, so that's the first. Second is, um, 
we'll be looking for a director of marketing. We'll be looking for a director of, um, in, maybe it's enrollment and marketing. Do they go together? Yeah, okay. And uh, business development, trying to create these job boards. So we'll be looking to invest three or four positions in this area. Um, we're fortunate because the system already has in place a bunch of the verticals. I mean, if you go on Southern New Hampshire University's website, for you know, they have 17 different vice presidents. Well, we don't need 17 vice presidents. Great, we already have a general counsel. We already have a provost. We already have human resources. We have a lot of the, the details that we already um, that they had to hire, you know, from scratch. We have the campuses. We have your teams. So we just got to figure out how do we take advantage of all this wealth uh, in a very efficient way. So opportunity is if we can add 10, uh, 20, pro get to a point where we're adding 20 unique programs that on average are attracting hundreds of students, we can get to 20,000 in five years. That's good, that's our goal. Now Kim, I thought the story you were gonna say about Hopkins was not the, the data analytics, but it's actually, so there's a gal that worked there, it was fabulous, Sarah Steinberg, if you've ever run across her, I don't know if you know her, but she's great. She, back in the, you know, in the, the first part of this century, like, you know, 2007, 2009, she had 3,000 students online, and she had professors all over, the, all over the world teaching. So I walked into her office one day, and I said, Sarah, what would it take to get to 30,000? She said, you need to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've recently seen, I think she's with a company now, and I forget, it's a, a company where she's doing exactly that. So I thought it was, it was a very cute story. That's the story I thought you were going to tell. So anyway, mostly I just wanted to say thank you. This is like my highest priority. This is, I think, very important for really taking our mission to scale. So thank you. Any questions um, that I heard you were a very verbal group, so I'm <laughs> I would like to say I love the the uh, the shirts and also the uh, I took one of the mugs home in full disclosure, so I have a, a mug at home that was really really clever, very nice. Yes. Hi, Sean. No, Sean, thank you. I, that's exactly right. I mean, they, and I think that's the reason why SUNY Online is something that's perfect for the, the system to help drive because the kind of investment, it's an on, on the order of 100 million, right? On the order of, you know, more than 50, more than, I guess more than 30 is on the order in exponential sense, but it's, it's 70 million or more. It's probably more than any one campus would it might not be more than any one campus that the university center could invest, but probably more than they would invest. And it's a, a risk investment profile. And, you're, and the other thing that, that you all may know, um, certainly, Sean, I know you would know this, that um, after 2028, Oracle's not going to support PeopleSoft anymore. So there are a lot of, I mean, we've got to figure out 
for the campuses that are, that are supportive of that and on PeopleSoft systems, what we're going to do, and 2028 may seem like a long ways away, but when you start to do the backward stair step towards procurement and deciding what we're all going to do and the cost and pulling the trigger and rolling it out so that we don't, um, I have been, uh, I've come into a university that I didn't do the rollout in a way that um, gave people training and it just popped up and that's gonna, we cannot do that. That's really bad. So anyway, thank you. It's it's right around the corner. Yes. Hello. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Eileen Worley. I'm the CIO at Monroe Community College. So we're kind of budding up here. But my question is not about technology. I think one of the things we found at Monroe is that one of the biggest barriers are cultural barriers and the way it's always been done and the perception of faculty. So I don't know if there are any initiatives going on on that side to kind of make people understand the imperative here and that the world, I mean, we, I've seen so many presentations in regard to SUNY Online that the world is changing in all these different ways, demographics and our adult student population and the challenges and I think we're doing all the right things, but we have put into place barriers to, to, to Sean's point, to all students in terms of developmental, developmental education and testing and making sure our students are college ready and I think we're trying to flip that to make sure that our colleges are student ready. So I didn't know if you had any comment on that. No, Eileen, um, Eileen, right? Yeah. yeah. So great point. Um, I know the provost has an advisory committee that was comprised of faculty and staff, right? And staff to work through some of the cultural perceptions around um, this change. And, you know, I think there's some other things that we need to look at pretty quickly, going back to technology just for a minute. We have an open SUNY platform, and now we're building SUNY online. And the open SUNY needs to be merged in, and it needs to be one platform quickly. Um, so, you know, I think cultural, what, what I've learned uh, in the two and a half years I've been chancellor is that I, if we get together, individuals uh, that are willing to try something new and they're successful, then more people come on and then more people come on. I mean, you look at all the, the SUNY Achieve, uh, the co-requisite model, it started out with a few campuses and then grew to 10 and then grew to 20 and now there's like 47. So it takes a little time and it takes uh, just sticking with it and it takes individuals like yourselves that are willing to come together, do the hard work, and be successful to bring everybody else along. Because, you know, change, change is hard, without a doubt. Um, so I think that's part of it, and I think it's the work that you're doing here that really helps move that forward as well. I think the other thing is education. So the reason why I say things like every student that is online has paid one of the major digital media advertisers five grand is to let people know there are real costs involved in trying to take this to scale and that any one campus probably can't do it by themselves. And if you want to take advantage of the wealth of SUNY, then you really need a platform that spans all of SUNY from the, both the technical and the student information systems. And we have what, you probably heard this from the provost presentation, 42 instances of banner, 47? Yeah, on the order. I mean, and so that makes it a little difficult to create that sort of seamless, if you will, connection for students and faculty across the system. But, you know, I think we're fixing that, so. I think the other thing is one last thing. Um, you have, um, as you know, the president of the Faculty Senate for the Community Colleges is uh, Christy Fogel, who teaches online. And her stats course, I mean, apparently, Del you know, University of Delaware and others in the Northeast, their professors say, yeah, don't take ours, just take it from, you know, Monroe Community College. So again, letting people know that this is a way to, again, expand our brand, expand our reach, expand our mission, is just, and show those successes. And right now, there's already campuses, th this is the thing that I, I see where, again, I, I say this just in the interest of communication, many of your campuses are already or had been negotiating with OPM's online program managers. So the split of the revenue there is 50-50. I mean, that's because they have to make a profit, right? 
So our split is we don't need to make a profit. We're going to turn those profits back to the campuses. So economically, it's a better deal, but it only works if we get to scale. Because, you know, it's sort of that there's this valley of death. It takes money to start these programs, so we're trying to find the resources to do the academic work, do the technical work, and, and then the students come. Well, that lag is when you either die or you make it through the desert, right? We need everybody working together to get through the desert. And this is my mes message to the presidents. And so I think, you know, working on some of the other verticals that we haven't been as active in, for example, if we have 80% or roughly of our students are traditional 18 to 24 year olds, then we're really not looking at the non-traditional students, the international students, the graduate students, the branded programs, the certifications. All those other verticals are fertile ground for us. And that's one way we can get to scale pretty quickly. At the same time, we've got to be mindful. We need incentives for the faculty because it, you know, more students, you need more resources to do a great job. And so I think that's where we need to hear what are those barriers and what we can do, you know, to put some carrots out there. Yes. Hi, I'm Hope from the Coil Center. Hi. And um, Hope Wendell, and Hi, Hope. I love to hear what you said about um, creating a job board, and I would love to s also weave internships into that, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know Perfect. at SUNY Ulster they had a job board, um, like a, a database kind of thing, and I wonder if there's a way to, I don't know, I'm looking to Harry and Israel that we can somehow bring all those wonderful job boards together to help um, I think that would be great hope. Um, yeah. So that's what I would expect the uh, director of the business development to work on. Now, who's hope in Israel? So I see faces. Harry. Harry I'm sorry. Harry. Your hope. Got it. <laughs> Harry. Great. I thought you might be Harry. And is Israel? Okay. Great. Yeah, I think that if we could get, if you could email um, either myself or Todd, you know, ask, uh, links or point us to the direction of where there are existing job boards. That's something that, mm -hmm. that I think would make sense to coordinate. Yeah, and also a couple of years ago, Alex had a great um, presenter who they were doing um, intern internships in connection with online um, programs. I can't remember. Yeah, which was amazing. So can, can I, if we could get that name too, that'd be great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest. Oh, is there another question? Yes. Bruce Shelton, Director of Distance Learning at Sioux Poly. Just a quick question to go back to one of the first things you mentioned in your opening remarks. Uh, the pandemic, how and when would we, would we expect some guidance on how the people in this room are going to have to help our faculty get all of their materials online? So should something hit? Yeah. So um, can you say one more time? Uh, I didn't quite hear the one word. Uh, the pandemic. The uh, pandemic. Okay. Uh, so I would like to know, like today, if you take a break, just email me what programs are sitting at State Ed to start, um, and then we will be giving guidance out to the presidents. We're actually sending out a notice today to all our presidents, and we're going to have a uh, all hands call. I believe on Monday, I don't know what time it is, but this is, um, and then during that call, I'm going to make the case for, look, this has got to be something that you pay attention to campus by campus to see what it would take to get, get your courses online. It's a great suggestion. I would not have been in that call without that, so thank you. I will make sure that's in our call now. Wonderful. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. Enjoy the... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Not only am I old, I'm obviously blind. So my apologies. Sorry, can, because I'm small, you know, small so... <laughs> uh, I'm so... My name is Yun Kashu. I'm the instructional designer of the SUNY Morseville. I'm so glad to see you in the person because I have to write the IITG. So I see what your video won't have of time about the four things, you know. So um, my question is that... Um, so far, you know, uh, after we begin to move the online program forward, 
and uh, so many students begin to select an um, online program and they don't need to worry about their location or something. So for our small size like a uh, college, like uh, people we all enroll the people uh, in our neighbors. But once they begin to find the online program in other, other place, how could we survive from the online you know, pro yeah. program you know, crash? Now, so. it's fabulous <laughs> to bring that up because that is exactly, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, the provost and myself. So here's what we're thinking, and really like to get your input because I think this is sort of a key, a key question. Let's go back to the assessment part that I was talking about a little bit, didn't go into much detail. So a student comes online. We had uh, 25 million views for our 10 videos. Uh, we had then from people viewing those videos for SUNY Online about, I don't know, 2 million or, well, a lot of people click through, and then of those maybe 40,000 ask for information. So there's a lot of people out there. Our initial pilot set of programs, uh, 20 programs at 10 campuses, was not enough to even uh, service all the interest for all those individuals. So we would then send them out to the campuses. And I think your question is, so how are they going to be sent to my campus versus someone else's campus? So what I think we need to do is come up with a, a, uh, a program because if we really grow to hundreds of thousands of inquiries, we've got to be able to address them very quickly or we lose them. So very quickly be able to assess a couple of what I would call principal components of the individual, right? So what I've been told, don't know if it's true, but you can tell me yes or no, that most of the folks who like to go, get their instruction online are within 50 to 100 miles of their campus. So if you were designing a program that was going to assess which is the best SUNY for you? Now, have you ever been put on hold when you called SUNY? And talks about, you know, want to be part of something bigger, which is great. I love that part. The next thing should be, and I think it is, we have a SUNY for you. Then the question is, well, which one? So we need to assess, come up with, and this is where we need knowledge from our faculty, our staff, and our students about how do we match them to a SUNY? So you have a number of programs. I would say if you can be thinking on your campus of what are the unique programs that you have. So Mor Morrisville State, I think you have the largest herd in the, uh, in the system, right, 200 cattle. So there might be something about animal husbandry that could be put online that would make sense for your faculty. I know you also have um, micro hydro and solar and micro wind uh, certification and credentialing. So again, that would be, so we need to understand at a very granular level, let's go back to those molecules, right, and then the structure, what is unique about a particular campus and how does that match the unique interests of the students? So one would be location, two would be uh, maybe something about their background. Do they already have a, any college education under, under their belt? Are they interested in the things that you're known for? So I think it's going to spark a conversation about creating uh, a real deep, soul searching for our campuses and us as a system is where are we the best, where are we distinctive, and how can we brand that so that students know where to go and how to get that education. I think that's one. I think a second one is to look at programs. Uh, I had a presentation recently from a campus that, that did a two by two quad, and I would encourage everyone to look at this where it said, you know, most interest, fewest online programs. Oversecting with, uh, intersecting, excuse me, overlaid with what we do on our particular campus. And that points to then the programs that I would encourage going online first. So I think there's a lot we have to learn. And I think um, it's summits like these that are going to bring people together, that raise these issues, get people talking so that the more we communicate, the more we'll build trust. The more we build trust, we'll have a more robust system and we won't leave anyone out. I think that's the biggest thing is uh, it took me a long time to learn. I mean, Kim said I started out as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. My, when I was assistant professor, the only thing I was like, get tenure, do your work, <laughs> show up at class, do your research. And you didn't have to tell anybody what you were doing. And then when I became dean, I now had a real boss that wanted to know, and I was constantly surprising the provost at Duke. If Todd's not laughing. See, he's, he's smirking because he knows this, right? But what I will learn in government is that's the worst thing you can do to somebody. It's the same here. The worst thing we could do to anyone is to surprise them with what we're doing, which is one of the reasons I wanted to be here to talk to the group so that you know 
everything that I know or I'm thinking, <laughs> it only took a half an hour, um, <laughs> on this topic. So I will, I think that was, a, you know, an excellent point and it'll keep it top of mind for all of us as we work through this. The good news is it's, we're not going to just overnight have, well, we could, actually. We could have hundreds of programs online overnight, but if we do the work that you're doing here, we'll choose them in a way that's going to enhance uh, the individual campuses. And something that I said in my inauguration, and I'll say it again because I want you to hear it, it's easy to say the whole should be greater than the sum of the parts. Well, that puts all the onus on the parts to be part of the whole, but what's the responsibility of the whole to make the parts stronger? That's what we need at System to be mindful of every single day. So thank you. Wonderful last question, right? Yay. Wonderful first question. Too. Thank you so much, Chancellor.